Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for today's webinar. And my name is Sebastian Tobar. I am the Senior Business Development Manager at Trade and Investment Queensland. Trade and Investment Queensland, or TIQ, is the Queensland government's dedicated global business agency, helping Queensland exporters take their products and services to world markets and promoting Queensland as a perfect destination for investment. The TIQ office for Latin America is located in Santiago, Chile, uh, where I am right now. Uh, from here, we cover most of the region with a focus on the Pacific Alliance, which is Chile, Peru, and Colombia. Uh, and also, we work in Argentina and Brazil. Today, we are presenting Queensland Technology Solutions for the cotton industry with guest speakers, uh, Anthony Holtz, the director at Agvitech, Tom Downing, CEO at Goana AG, Andrew Bate, founder at Swan Farm, G. Hudson, uh, managing director at TTQ. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. If they are for a particular speaker, please include this detail. I will also bring the questions up at the end of the presentations. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Eduardo Ferreira from the Australian Agricultural Council for South America. And this webinar is supported by the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, Austrade, a Sao Paulo office. And today we have the participation of Mr. Fabio Nave, Investment Director uh, in Sao Paulo. And I would like Fabio to share a few words about the role of Austrade in Brazil. Please, Fabio. Thanks, Sebastian. It's a pleasure to be here today with you all. Uh, as Sebastian mentioned, uh, my name is Fabio Navi. I'm an investment director at the Australian Trade and Investment Commission here in Brazil. We are based at the Australian Consulate here in Brazil. So Austrade is Australia's federal uh, government agency for trade promotion and investment attraction into Australia. Uh, here in, in Brazil, we assist Australian companies from, from multiple sectors, but the agribusiness sectors, sector is one of our main sectors here due to the size of the Brazilian market and, and the opportunities with Australia. So here in Brazil, we assist Australian companies in the ag sector with market research, introduction to local partners, visit programs in the market here, or referrals to service providers. So we facilitate uh, everything that is, that is necessary for the company to look for opportunities here in the market and, and find the right partner or the market, uh, the right entry strategy in the market here. Uh, we also work with Brazilian investors uh, in the agribusiness sector and in other sectors as well. So we, we assist these companies to understand the opportunities for them in the Australian market, look for potential partners in Australia, and maybe expand their agricultural operations in, in the Australian market as well. Um, just would like to mention that, you know, Brazil is one of the largest agricultural producers in the world. Uh, here, ag agribusiness represents more than 20% of our national GDP and more than 40% of our exports. Uh, the current agricultural output uh, this year is over 251 million tons. And so there are a lot of opportunities for Australian companies here. Uh, we have been working with a few ag techs from, from Australia. There are new hubs here in Brazil in different regional areas. So it's an interesting moment and an interesting opportunity for Australian companies to be exploring the, the opportunities in the market here. Well, thank you, Fabio. Uh, Austria is a great partner for TIQ in our region and we appreciate uh, your participation today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. And and I'm very pleased to introduce our first presenter today, Mr. Anthony Hoss from the company Agritech. Thank you, Sebastian.
I hope everyone can see uh, my slides. Is, is that correct, Sebastian? Yes. Great. Well, thank you again. Um, yes, uh, as Sebastian, my name is Anthony Hawes. I'm one of the founders and uh, director of Ag Biotech. Uh, I think I've been invited today to participate in this webinar um, because we have some experience uh, uh, working in Brazil. Uh, Ag Biotech was started in 2000 and we, we had a very big, very much an Australian focus and then a US focus for about the first 13 years of the business. But in 2013, we started looking into Brazil um, and, and, and saw an opportunity there, uh, particularly in the uh, broad acre cropping sector. I'll mention that I'm focusing on Brazil, not Argentina, mainly because uh, we we don't our products, uh, Ag Vitex products, don't really fit into Argentina as well. And also, uh, Argentina is a little more challenging uh, market to enter. We found just from a regulatory point of view, and just some sovereign issues as well. So, as a result, the company has not yet entered Argentina, but I think he's looking to do so in the next year or two. But uh, so my main focus today will just be to set up everyone else's presentations in so much so far as trying to uh, bridge between how Australia and Brazil have a lot of similarities uh, in their cotton production systems. But first of all, just a quick, um, a quick summary of Ag Biotech in Brazil. I've been uh, fortunate to travel to Brazil many times over the last uh, five or seven years or so. And uh, in that time, we've estab we established uh, an operation there First of all, just with a very small team, uh, all working remotely, but today we now have about 60 employees uh, working in all of the major um, broad acre uh, crop producing states. Uh, you know, Brazil is huge, of course, as everyone knows, it's uh, somewhat bigger than Australia and, and does have some uh, challenging um, ch challenges around uh, moving around uh, Brazil, especially into the, some of the agricultural areas. And uh, and also um, also just just uh, just different different regions, substantially different uh, production systems in different regions, and also language issues for Australians as well. Uh, unlike Brazilians, most Australians only speak one language, so we um, we have to struggle along. But uh, we've had a very successful um, business in Brazil. It's now our, by by a substantial margin our biggest market, uh, the company's biggest market, and. We're targeting a, a caterpillar pest uh, market of about 700 million, um, and, and that has been larger. It's reducing somewhat due to BT technology, but it's still very substantial, uh, and that's US dollars. Um, part of the reason for our success is that we uh, employed a very um, capable uh, Brazilian, um, Adriano Villas Boas. He's now the company's CEO, actually, as well. Previously, he was manager for Brazil, but has been promoted to CEO. Uh, and having good people on the ground, obviously, is very, very important. And, and that's been one of the um, the best parts about working in Brazil is there is a lot of very capable people, particularly um, well-trained, scientifically trained agricultural agriculturalists in Brazil. And ju the, just a brief list of the company's products. They're, the company makes bac uh, baculoviruses. I'm not going to go into the company very much, but the company makes baculovirus-based insecticides. Uh, again, designed to kill most the main caterpillar pests. Uh, and there's a list of the products there, which I won't go into. So enough about Ag Biotech. Um, my next slide here is just to talk about uh, just, just some big numbers for Australian cotton. I think it's in, uh, uh, probably a lot of people listening already know, know some of this, um, but I thought it would be worth putting up. And I've also included a little, just a bit of a reference point. This is about the uh, latitude of Cuiabá. Uh, in Brazil, uh, and this is the latitude for Corrientes in Argentina. So just to give some geographic reference, it's actually quite important because the agro agronomy of cotton is, is very much impacted by the climate that it's grown in. And you can see that a lot of, a, a lot of Brazilian cotton is grown in a very tropical area, whereas uh, Argentinian cotton is grown in a more temperate climate. So there is a lot more similarity, uh, somewhat more similarities from an agronomic point of view in Argentina, but there are a lot of similarities also in Brazil. So the Australian cotton industry is um, really broken up into th three main growing areas. And there's, there's moving to almost a fourth one now because there is some production happening in the more tropical areas here in Queensland, but also in Western Australia. 
we'll see some more cotton production there. So Australia will, will really have four um, production regions in the near future. And th those production regions really are determined by the climate, um, particularly the rainfall, um, uh, 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 but, but also, um, also just the day length. So in the southern regions, very, sh very short season, so it has to be grown in a very narrow window. Whereas for, as you go further north, the window uh, widens substantially as to when cotton can be planted and, uh, and harvested. But just some big numbers. Um, Australia produces uh, in a good year, about half a million hectares. Um, there's about half a million hectares grown under cotton. Uh, and that produces somewhere in the range of about 3.5 to 5 million bales per year. And almost all of that cotton is, is uh, exported. Uh, well, pretty much all of the cotton is exported with the majority, a, a, a substantial proportion going to China. But one thing that's worth noting is the chain cotton farms are on average quite relatively small, particularly relative to Brazilian farms, on average about 300 hectares. Um, though there is a, a significant number less than that and a smaller number substantially more than that. So there are some quite large cotton farms in Australia, but certainly nothing on the scale of some of the biggest farms in Brazil. Another thing that's important to note is that the majority of Australian cotton in most years is irrigated. It does vary depending on the water availability. Uh, all of that water, that most of that irrigation water is surface water. So it's uh, caught uh, in dams and in dry years that that water is not available. Um, but in, in, in a typical year, roughly 90% of Australian cotton is irrigated. And as a result, uh, or and in spite of the rain, uh, the lack of rain in Australia, Australian uh, cotton yields are uh, the highest in the world, um, somewhat close to double uh, or, or above um, average cotton yields globally. So Australia really has pushed the envelope in terms of what, what is possible in cotton yield uh, through, through uh, outstanding management, but also through um, a very good breeding program as well for cotton. And part of that too is that Australia has got very high quality lid. Uh, it typically uh, close to half of the Australian cotton is graded as premium. And so that's really highly sought after by uh, a lot of the mills uh, overseas. And, and now for, for my, actually my last slide, um, and it's a bit wordy, I apologize, but I'll just jump through some of the key points because I think it's important to understand where there are particular similarities between Australia and Brazil and where there are some differences. Because I think that helps to understand where Australian technology can fit uh, and where, uh, or where it's more likely to fit or how Australian technology can fit into the Brazilian cotton system. And, and uh, many of these are, are in contrast to what it's what, uh, the situation in the United States where we, uh, Ag Biotech and I also have a lot of experience in cotton. Um, so the first one, which I think is one of the, actually one of the main drivers is there's very low subsidies in Australia and, and also in, in Brazil. In fact, in Australia, really there's no subsidies. Uh, arguably. And uh, that's part of the reason why there's been a very heavy drive for efficiency in all of Australian agriculture, not just cotton. But, but also there is a very strong influence from consultants in Australian cotton, and mostly independent crop, crop consultants, but also on farm agronomists or, or consultants um, who work for some of the larger farms. And that's important um, because it's a very, that they are an outstanding, a very good channel for um, for bringing new technology to market. And, and that does contrast somewhat in, a, in the US. There is consultant influence, but that, those consultants tend not to be uh, broad across all the whole production system. They tend to be very specific on pest management or sometimes water management. But generally we find um, Australian Brazilian consultants are across the entire production um, system. And, and I mentioned the constant drive for efficiency. I think uh, we see that, we've seen that in Australia and we continue to see it. I'm not sure how more efficient Australian cotton farmers can be, to be honest, but it's, it's still there, this constant drive. And we see that in Brazil too. Um, it's, a, it's a constant effort by these, these very innovative farmers to improve efficiency. And that's one of the great opportunities for Brazil to take on some Australian, Australian technology. And, and, and to that point, Australian and Brazilian farmers are very early adopters of technology, we found. Um, the technology might not even come out of Australia or, or Brazil, but often, often Australia and Brazil are the first to take it and actually make it work well. 
there's quite a lot of IT used for operations, whether that's um, remote sensing um, and, and many other types of IT, but it's, uh, it's being really heavily utilised. Uh, in Australia, I think because of the cost of labour and, and, and just the value it brings, and in Brazil, those things, but also the scale of the farms are very large. So use of, use of remote and other IT, remote sensing and other IT type um, technologies have been very useful. Uh, the majority of the lint's exported from both Australia and Brazil, um, and both countries have quite quite uh, significant environmental challenges, whether that's the weather, but also um, environmental pressure uh, from, from the community to uh, improve. Uh, both countries get high pest pressure, but um, I think uh, Australian farmers probably don't know how good they've got it sometimes because Brazil really does cop very high pressure. Uh, and that does often, often, um, you know, dominate uh, a lot of the management practices in Brazil. And there is a, a lot of strategic use of plant growth regulators. In Australia, it's, to, it's, it's, um, it, it's primarily to uh, manage the plant to, to increase yield. And, and in Brazil, because there is a lot of rainfall, um, rain fig, um, that there is a need to manage the plant as well. So I mentioned that because I think that is an opportunity for um, improved crop management uh, and better use of PGRs. And there's a lot of work being done in Australia on that at the moment. But some of the big differences I think it's worth highlighting is that um, Brazil is a much more intensive cropping system. And what I mean by that is that in some regions, there's um, you know, two and a half crops being grown per year. Uh, and, and, you know, literally a crop's being harvested and there's a crop being planted right behind that. So, um, so that intensivity does, does impact the ability to uh, undertake operations um, on, on the farm. There's quite a few varying soil types in Brazil, where most of Australian cotton is grown in a, in a fairly narrow soil type range and mostly heavy clays. In Brazil, there's a very wide, type of, uh, a wide variety of soils that cotton's been grown on. And of course, that, that does have an impact on the type of equipment, the type of management. The majority of uh, Brazilian cotton is rain fed, uh, roughly 90%. Uh, in, in the state of Bahia, there is a significant amount of irrigation, but in, in the majority of regions, the crop is rain fed because of the very, um, very good summer rainfall that Brazil receives. I mentioned the very far, large farm units, and that obviously has a big impact on management uh, in Brazil. The tropical climate is a factor as well. Um, I mentioned pest pressure, but, but also many other um, aspects of that tropical climate where cotton is grown does impact management. But also, and this is an important one to finish on, the industry in Brazil is a lot more fragmented. There is a lot of communication, but compared to Australia where the industry works really closely together, has a very strong um, research and development um, uh, cooperation, and also just a very strong communication um, in various in various aspects, uh, and that, and that's something I think Brazil can definitely improve on, and, and I think it's trying to, but but is a, is a creates somewhat of a challenge to enter Brazil because you have to have um, multiple channels of communication to, um, to 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 meet with industry. But uh, that's that's the the end of my presentation, and um, I, I, I'm happy to take questions. But I think um, best to move on actually, and. Um, and, and get to the heart of the presentations. So thanks. Thank you, Anthony. And we will have some space at the end of the presentations for questions. Um, so if any of the attendees has one, please write down and, and we will go over them at the end of the, of the webinar. Uh, and actually, as TIQ, we are very impressed on how well the Brazilian market has received IBAC tech products uh, in such a short time. So thank you, Anthony. Uh, our next presenter is Mr. Andrew Bates from the company Farm Farm. Thanks, Sebastian. I'll just um, do a screen share. And um, can you see that shared screen now? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Um, I'm Andrew Bate. Um, I'm the founder of Swarm Farm Robotics, and I'm also a grain farmer from Queensland in Australia. <clears throat> in my farming operation, I do grow crops, including wheat, chickpeas, sorghum, mung beans, and I've also grown dryland cotton when the opportunity arises. We have had a, a string of very dry seasons, and um, 
and some gaps in pricing. So it's been a while since I've grown cotton, but um, spent some time as a cotton agronomist insect scouting years ago. Um, but what I'm here today to talk about is our autonomous technology. Swarm Farm is an Australian ag tech company and there's two things that we do. Um, we build autonomous agricultural robots and we also have a software ecosystem which we call Swarm Connect so that independent machinery manufacturers can release their implements as attachments on board our robots. Um, I'll just jump to the next slide. There we go. Um, this is one of our robots running um, a grain farm here in Queensland. It's 12 metre boom with 3 metre wheel space control track and farming. And uh, it's using weed IT cameras to spot spray the weeds. Our machines are fully autonomous. That machine's running 24 hours a day. It's got a built-in weather station, so it stops if the weather turns poor uh, in terms of wind speed, humidity, delta T, uh, wind direction as well. Our robots already work in a lot of industries, including grain, cotton, horticulture, turf farms and orchards. And we're one of the first companies to successfully deliver commercial autonomous robots to farming customers. Uh, we've had precision ag for a long time now, but the difficulty is to, in applying new technology out in the paddock and actually change the field practices we use to grow our crops. Um, Swarm Farm sits in field application in terms of how we grow our crops rather than data we're actually out there changing the practices we use to grow our crops. We partner with independent developers to release apps and attachments on board our robots to help solve ag's problems. Um, we just build the base robot, we don't build the attachments. So we don't build the spray booms, we don't build the spray tanks that go on our robots, we don't build the fertilizer spreaders. Um, we only build the base robot and we've got multiple partners that release their attachments as swarm as Swarm Connect attachments on board our robots. Um, people think of our robots as labour-saving devices. However, all of our customers are chasing a far bigger return on their robot. If you look at the fleet at the top left here, um, that fat robot at the top left there, it's actually, um, that robot's actually slashing grass in a uh, macadamia nut orchard. Um, it's a big picture project where we're working with that grower uh, not only with slashing operations, but also eventually moving all the way through to spreading mulch, um, spraying the mature trees, and eventually harvesting the nuts off the ground as well. The robot there in the right, uh, top right's got a fertilizer spreader on. Um, what we're doing here is applying targeted precision application of nitrogen. And that's pretty important. We're in a reef catchment here in Queensland and nitrogen use efficiency and runoff of nitrates into our river systems are super important. Um, what's interesting is it's a changing agronomy with autonomy. Um, what, you know, with precision fertilizer applications, it's not about putting out large rates. It's actually about putting out split applications, smaller amounts of fertilizer more regularly um, than what you would normally do. The one on the bottom left is fitted with weed IT or weed, it, weed detection technology. Um, our customers are saving up to 95% of that on the herbicide bill. And it's also really helping them tackle the herbicide resistant weed and move away from complete reliance on glyphosate. Um, but what's really important, once again, it's autonomous agriculture is changing the agronomy around how we farm. Customers using our robots are using different agronomy than their neighbours. It's not about how many acres you can farm in one day, and it's more about how many passes you can do in one season. Um, it changes, robots change the herbicides you use, the use of your residuals, the rotations you plan. It actually changes even, um, you know, it even opens up more cropping opportunities with less residuals in the system. Um, it's actually a different agronomic decision and we're treating weeds in a better way. When, when we deploy a robot, we, we go and talk to the agronomist working with the farmer that's bought our robot and, and chat to them about how this is going to change the way they actually, you know, work with their farmer customer. Um, the one in the bottom right is working on a turf farm mowing grass. You know, you could say it's just a labour saving device, but what the farmer is actually doing is achieving a 24 hour mowing cycle on his farm and no one in the industry does that. Um, but what, what, what you can achieve and if you can get to a 24 hour mowing cycle, you get a thicker turf for the thicker thatch that's better quality and that can eventually be sold for a premium. So 
Um, you know, the benefits in robots aren't, you know, about labor saving or automation. They're more about better cropping, better ways to grow crops, premiums for products. Um, more importantly, it's our focus on Swarm Connect partners, and, and they're the people who build the implements that go on board our robots that really make our robots more valuable to farmer customers. Um, we've got partners that are building booms now up to 18 metre wide with 3,000 litre tow behind tanks. Um, we've got mower decks for turf. We've got slashes for orchards and, and, and broader agriculture. Um, and we've got Weed IT already available on board our robots. The next generation of partners we're working on, working with, um, have got green on green weed detection technology coming for picking individual weeds out of crops. Um, there's more coming in terms of fertilizer spreaders. And we're also working with several companies that are working on non-chemical weed control based on heat technology um, to help break herbicide resistance and, and that reliance on glyphosate. Um, you know, none of these things are going to be a silver bullet, but they're going to be new tools in, in the hands of farmers, new tools in the toolbox to help break resistance cycles. And, um, you know, to have more options available than what we have now will be really, really exciting. Over the past four years, um, our robots have weeded, sprayed or mowed over 200,000 acres of farmland here in Australia. That's from, you know, broad acre cotton farms um, through to horticulture, turf farms and orchards. Um, in the second half of 2021, um, so second half of next year, we'll be ready to take on overseas pilot customers. So we're looking to find the right early adopters to begin that journey. Um, we see it as a partnership um, you know, more, more than a sale, to be honest, um, about people we can work with in new markets and new crops and, 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 and begin that journey with them. We're also looking to partner with other ag tech developers with technology that can be attached on board our robots, uh, more planters, uh, different sprayers, um, all the different attachments and things that go on board, everything from soil sampling devices um, through eventually, um, you, know, um, you know, attachments that can pick crops as well. Ultimately, we're revolutionising agriculture by providing a robotic platform that delivers precision technology into the, into the hands of farmers. Um, thanks very much for your time and um, happy to chat later on. Thank you. I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I actually had a chance to see one of those uh, farm farm robots in action. Uh, when I was in Queensland uh, a couple of years ago, and it was very impressive at the time, and I know it has gotten much better <laughs> by now. Yeah, uh, thank you. That would have been um, <laughs> nearly four or five years ago with some of our early prototypes. And... I, I, I believe so. I believe so. Very impressive. Yeah. Uh, our next presenter is Mr. Tom Dowling from the company Goana AG. Tom, please. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so Go in Arag. Go in Arag is a farm sensor monitoring company. Go in Arag is the le leading sensor company for the Australian cotton industry. And over the past 18 years, we've um, supplied such sensor products as weather stations, soil moisture probes, plant canopy sensors, satellite imagery, rain gauges. We monitor all things water on a farm, so channels, dams, tanks, and water meters. And we also monitor some in inventory around, we monitor diesel tanks and, and fertilizer tanks. So the problem, we have one earth, climate variability, a growing population, and a finite resource. The Brazilian cotton industry, strong recent and forecasted growth, increasing yields up to eight bales per hectare, 10% irrigated, so 175,000 hectares. And then the Australian cotton industry, um, 300,000 hectares average, but massive seasonal volatility, 90% irrigated and 10 bales per hectare. To grow more cotton, we need land, water, nutrition, and energy. How efficient is the use of these resources? To maintain a profitable and sus sustainable cotton industry, we need to grow more for less, reduce our footprint, 
and optimize every precious drop of water. So how do we grow more cotton from less water? So here's one example. So what I'm displaying here is out of our, um, our GoField product. Our GoField product is a integrated sensor unit that stands in the field and, and we use a soil moisture probe to measure what's happening underneath the ground. We use a canopy temperature sensor to measure what's happening in the plant above the ground. We use satellite imagery to, to measure what's happening at a field level. And then we use weather data, both real time and forecasted to give you insights into when your next irrigation event might be happening or what's going to, what's going to affect your crop in the, in the coming days. So what this data driven solution can provide is this. Why does the crop on the left at eight bars per hectare and the crop on the right yield 12.7 bars per hectare? So for the trained eye, the graph on the left shows a crop in stress shown in pink. When only 15 millimetres, it is from a fully saturated soil profile. The graph on the right shows a small amount of stress indicated by the pink colour again, occurring when the soil moisture profile is at 60 millimetres from a fully saturated profile. So the graph on the left has more stored water, more stored soil water, more stress and less yield. So why? So this, this two graphs here in comparison are showing the root systems underneath these crops. So what, why this occurred was crop stress. And a sense, our sensor data showed 148 hours of stress versus six hours. The eight, hour, the eight bale crop on the left also had more in crop water available. So it doesn't matter how much water you have in your soil profile. If you don't build a big pump, the root system, you won't be able to supply the crop above the ground what it needs in high demand growth stages. So the solution begins in the field from data-driven decisions. So Go and Arag currently have well over 50% of the Australian cotton growers using our products. The USDA invited us to America in 2019, and we commercially launched in Texas and Oklahoma this season in 2020. So the Go and Arag suite of products are simpler, smarter, and cheaper. We can offer low cost connectivity through different types of communication, LoRaWAN, satellite, and cellular, we offer less, less manual management with our sensors, higher productivity through the use of those data-driven solutions and improved water use efficiency. So how could we work together, either on the farm with our sensor and analytics from our weather stations, soil moisture probes, canopy temperature sensors, rain gauges and tank monitoring, either diesel, fertilizer or water, or collaborations region-wide trials, supply chain partnerships through fuel distribution, fertilizer distribution, grow benchmarking, the seed companies or ginners, or sustainable apparel, sustainable, sorry, sustainable apparel brands. The potential to invest to unlock the Brazilian opportunity with Go Interag. So what does more precise irrigation look like? It looks like more cotton, sustainable apparel, and more water. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you, Tom. Um, and our final presenter is Mr. G. Hudson from the company TTQ. Thank you, Sebastian. So, presumably um, you can see that presentation. Um, so, 
My name is uh, G Hudson. I'm the uh, the owner and manager of TTQ. Um, so TTQ makes a, a range of heavy duty machinery. Um, our place in the Australian market is essentially we make the the heaviest machinery available, essentially the strongest, and uh, we have a reputation for making machinery that doesn't break. Um, as Anthony touched on. Uh, Australia isn't as big as Brazil, but uh, our tyranny of distance is similar. The, we have a lot of very remote farms, so we concentrate on making machines that don't really need fixing because it's very difficult to get to a town to get things fixed. Um, we have a small US business. We've been in the US for about four years now, um, trying to um, show some American farmers how to do it a little bit better. Um, and we've exported in the last 18 months about 30 containers full of um, our machinery to Uzbekistan for cotton farms there. So pre-COVID, we were starting to expand globally and uh, have uh, contracted slightly now. Um, Anthony set the scene for Australian cotton farmers, but they focus on clearing out cotton as soon as possible, essentially. Um, they want to either get the next crop or put cover in straight away. And uh, our machines are often in the field at the same time as the pickets uh, in an ideal world. 70% of Australian cotton farms in this country follow a three-part cycle. They, uh, as they pick, they then they'll mulch, mulch the crop um, at whatever height they feel is important. They'll root cut it, which I'll get to in a minute, and then they'll cultivate it again if needed. Um, we're now working uh, heavily in the northern regions of Australia that Anthony also talked about, where in um, the Northern Territory in Western Australia, and they'll be pretty much 100% uh, dry land operations, but most of our gear at the moment is in uh, irrigated cotton. There's lots of similarities though. Um, so the mulcher, I'm going to focus on a couple of machines. Obviously, we make uh, 30, 40 different types of machines, but uh, the mulcher is probably the, um, the most common globally used machine in cotton. Uh, our, our mulcher is, as I've said, incredibly strong. We focus on speed and durability. So speed across the field. Um, it's often a job can... Um, in Australia that's uh, carried out by what we call contract farmers. So specialists that come in with their own machinery, the farmer may not necessarily own his own mulcher. Um, they often need to mulch it all very quickly because of pressures from either the weather window or the next planting cycle. So these things need to be running quickly and running all the time. Um, so we, we built uh, a mulcher that looks similar to other available machines globally, but is very different when you, when you actually look into how, how it operates. Um, it's almost twice as heavy as um, any other major competitor's machine in the globe. And we found in America, um, for instance, uh, in the US, that the, it literally is more than twice as heavy as many of the machines they use. Consequently, it lasts an awful lot longer. We have an expected life cycle of our machine that's 10 to 15 times as long as some of the machines commonly available there. So they have an operating speed of around 12 to 14 kilometers an hour. Some people do go quicker in lighter cotton, um, but we're talking about um, being able to operate in 14 bale cotton at that speed. Um, the knives and flails spin at 2,000 RPM. Um, they don't really require servicing. They require um, cleaning and they require oiling. Uh, we don't expect to see any of these machines back here to have a look at um, inside the first 100,000 acres, 40,000 40, hectares. We've got four in the yard at the moment that are being reviewed. They've all done that sort of number and none of them need any bearing changes. They just need a clean down and a... Um, there's a few chips in some of the fl uh, flail lugs. The parts that we do have are really easy to source and very easy to repair. The whole thing is actually a kit that can be dismantled. So as strong as it is, it, uh, it's easy to fix if you do crash it. Um, not just used in cotton, it's used uh, extensively in corn and sorghum, for example, any row crop. 
the flail pattern is the key to the, the way the machine works, functions. So it's a stronger frame. And then inside of that frame, we put a drum that's specifically designed for the row configuration the farm it's going to, or a number of farms if it has to. Uh, the, uh, the, the flail life of uh, those trails is around six to 8,000 acres, it depends on the weather. Uh, it smashes the stalk into very small pieces and cleans the top of the, uh, of the plant line. That's useful if you're going to go through a root cut, but may not be necessarily what everyone's going to do. Um, the machine remains in perfect balance as it operates because of this um, flail system. So we uh, talk to our customers and if they think they're having a problem, we ask them to open a can of Coca-Cola or something like that, put it on the uh, hood of the machine and run it at full speed. If any of that Coke shakes out or the can vibrates, then there's something needs to fix it. And it's usually just the thing, the machine needs a bit of cleaning because some cotton paste is built up on the drum. So we literally want these machines just to start on day one and bar some cleaning and oiling, not stop for the entire season. They are also operating at very extremely high temperatures. So in our Western Queensland cotton regions, it can easily be um, 40 degrees and uh, these machines will be running hot. We, we don't expect people to be running them 24 hours a day, but people are running them 22 hours a day, allowing some time for cleaning. So that's the, uh, the mulch. I mentioned the root cutter. Now, root cutter is a uniquely Australian machine. It was developed here in Australia, and it essentially is two spinning discs that cut the cotton roots between two and four centimeters under the ground. That leaves that stalk buried. Uh, two reasons, principally, that the root cutter uh, has found favor in Australia is, is one, that will kill the, generally kill the plant because it leaves it buried, and that stalk will not see daylight and therefore won't grow, generally. And uh, two, it leaves, a, um, it leaves that stalk um, biomass to degrade. And when people, farmers go to plant back on that line, they, they, they've got some substance. Um, it's not usually used in dryland or not commonly. I'd say 50% of dryland operations will still use a root cutter, but it comes a bit more difficult on the larger scale root cutters. So you can see them on the pictures there in the top right. That's a 12 row root cutter, which is as big as we make them and um, it can be difficult. On the left-hand side, you can see root cutters actually attached to mulches. So we do make machines, combination machines for, for um, customers here who just want to do everything at one pass. They, um, just see through the next slide. So you can see a cut stalk in the uh, bottom right picture there, uh, and there's slight discoloration, I don't know if you can pick it up, of the stalk, and that's where the soil, it was under the ground. So they're used on approximately 90% of Australian cotton farms. Um, they're used extensively in corn um, and sorghum as well. The operating speed is, is very fast. I mean, as we say 16 to 22 kilometers an hour, there's some younger, maybe a little bit more reckless drivers in some of our regions that will be running at 24 kilometers to 25 kilometers an hour. Um, the machine doesn't mind the speed. Uh, the machine also doesn't need much of a service. So there's discs will wear out over time and need to be replaced, but nothing else on it wears out uh, in any sort of small, small time period. We don't usually see these machines back for a service until they've done at least 50,000 hectares. There are a couple of them here that just need a few um, worn parts replaced from that sort of use. Um, but yeah, they're very robust machine other than that. We've exported a few of these machines to the US in the last few years, and um, they're performing very well in cotton, but most of the US farmers are actually using them in corn because they have such a, a high density corn mass that they're cutting that out so they can plant on it for next season. Um, so there's some interesting trials coming out of the US in corn where they're getting um, reasonably good returns in, in yield from using the root cutter as opposed to just planting into the, um, the previous corn. Um, so that might be useful in future. Um, I touch very briefly then on cultivation. So uh, there is a, 
a lot of cultivation machines we make, um, very large combination of different things. These are essentially in irrigated cotton, giant plows and machines used to, to hill up and rip through and, and clean up trash. There are lots of different theories in Australian cotton as to which combination of machines you'd use. The one on the left with those discs in the air is just ready for transport, but that one is called a side buster and it basically knocks the cotton root left and right while the cotton root is buried. And then the, uh, the blades at the back put the beds back together and, uh, and make a hill, which is obviously important for the irrigation. Um, once again, they, we focus on strength and flexibility, so we, we don't expect to see these machines ever again once they've run out, and we don't expect to hear of any problems from our customers having, having issues with them. We, we build them for the very big tractors that a lot of the Australian cotton farmers use now, 550, 600 horsepower tractors. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I know we're trying to catch up time, so I'll, uh, I'll finish there. That, that picture is one of our um, deep rippers in Western Australia. It's uh, just a, an example of the size and scale of machines that we can build. That's a 26 ton machine that um, has 20 tons on it and is used to break the clay pans open to let moisture out. Um, I'll just stop my sharing there. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, G. And I actually look forward to the day uh, we find one of these attachments to one of those swan farms robots. <laughs> that would be great. It's just a matter of power, I guess. Yeah, we do make some small machines, smaller machines, and Andrew and I need to talk about <laughs> what sort of horsepower <laughs> we need to do that. But absolutely, it's the way uh, forward because it's a really boring task in a lot of things we do. That that will be nice. <laughs> I, I believe that that will make some farm geeks very very happy. <laughs> well, um, thank you everyone for your presentations. Uh, I just wanted to mention again that this webinar was recorded and will be shared upon the request. And well, it seemed like some people had problems with their registration. Either uh, had a problem receiving the link, or uh, I mean receiving a few messages. So uh, we will be sharing the, the recorded version of the webinar and hopefully getting some uh, translation and, and caption also uh, to reach a wider, uh, wider audience. Uh, so, so it will be available later on. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, we will have... Uh, a small round, uh, so don't be shy. Michael. Hi, Seb Sebastian. Yes, Fabio. I, I, I believe, uh, uh, Fabio, if you don't mind, we have a raised hand by Micah De Brito. Micah nah, De Brito. No problem. No problem. I don't know, uh, uh, Mika, if you can either type on the chat or unmute yourself. I don't know if, if we can unmute him. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Fabio, please. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, I have a question for Anthony. So Anthony, just interested to know, uh, what were the main challenges that you faced when, when you came to Brazil first? What are your views on the challenges of the market here for Australian companies? And also interested to hear your views on this new frontier for cotton in Australia in the north. We have been seeing some interest from Brazilian companies and also Argentine companies in exploring the opportunities for agricultural expansion in Northern Australia, in Northern Queensland and, and the, the Northern Territory as well. So just interested to know your views on, on that. Yes, thanks Fabio. Um, 
Mark, I'll take the second question first. And um, the uh, the Argentinians, Brazilians will have to compete with the Australians and the Chinese, I think, to uh, cry cotton in the north. There's a lot of interest up there. Look, I, I, I have a reasonably narrow um, experience. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. But, but I think um, Australian cotton has been attempted in the north several times um, over several decades. And for various reasons, it has not succeeded. Uh, it's worth mentioning that one of the one of the real attractive parts of growing cotton in the north is the, the availability of water, which has been mentioned a lot today, um, particularly in the Ord uh, catchment, which is in the northern part of Western Australia. But th there are some very specific uh, and critical um, issues related to uh, particularly pest management. Um, one of the things that caused cotton to fail up there in the past has been um, was, was, was resistance and issues with um, pink, pink spotted bollworm uh, up there. And now we do have four army worm in Australia as well. So there are some, uh, and I'm a pest guy, so um, take that with a grain of salt, but I think there is a substantial risk there and I think it needs to be managed very carefully. But at the same time, I think I think we've, we've reached a turning point where it's inevitable now that we'll see significant areas of cotton in the north. Uh, it, 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 it will just require careful management. And, and, and I think, um, Australia's got a good history of, 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 of dealing with those issues fairly well, but, but it, it is a major challenge up there. So, um, so that's one side. I think the other side, uh, the other question was related to our experience in Brazil. I, I probably, there's probably not enough uh, time on this call to go into all of the uh, challenges that we had. We did have very, very many challenges. And I think that they almost, you can, you name it, 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 it occurred, whether it's, the little things like um, j just obviously, you know, language uh, it was, it was initially challenging, but uh, but also, um, um, you know, the, the, the distance and the challenges moving around Brazil. So, you know, I would go on three week trips from Australia to visit Brazil because you just needed that length of time to get the work done. And it's a, and it's a long way from Australia. So when we established operations in the United States, it made it much, much easier to access Brazil because, you know, same time zone, many more flights. It was, it, it, I was leaving on a Sunday and getting back on a, on a Saturday uh, and getting a lot of work done in a week. So, and no jet lag. So those, those obvious little things, um, but, but I think probably d the deeper issues are around red tape, we, we call regulations, um, things that and things that are required in Brazil that honestly, I think a lot of Australians and even Americans wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't imagine that would be there. It's certain certain rules and regulations that that you know are very frustrating, frankly. But you have to deal with them, and gen generally, to deal with them, you either have to have an excellent partner on the ground or have your own operation. And we we discovered reasonably quickly that really to continue in Brazil, we needed to have our own entity and have our own um, administration, if you like, to manage some of these issues. Um, we, we, you know, we needed a lawyer and an accountant very early on, um, which in many cases you wouldn't need. You could get away with avoiding those services, but really is essential. And then the st there's state um, issues, state to state. In Australia, there's really no state board issues, but in Brazil, there are, there are significant issues. Um, and also just simple things like, I, I explain this as a layman, but in Australia, our regulations sit below legislation, but in Brazil, a lot of regulations are actually legislated. So whereas, you know, there's a rule, there's a rule that can be sort of tweaked or, or bent a little bit to, to make it work. In Brazil, if there's a rule, you can't really bend it. Um, and, and really mundane things that can be really problematic for, for getting, um, for, for doing business in Brazil. So. So yeah, lots of issues, but um, I, I mean, I think it's, it is worth it for sure. It, it just requires a recognition that it's significantly harder, especially for companies that have got experience in, in the United States and going to the US, um, which is not a perfect market, but in terms of running, doing business, it is a much, much simpler market. And, um, and I think Argentina is a level above that again, in our experience. When we look to go to Argentina, we almost had to, we, we, we had to walk away because it was just too challenging for a small company like us. But now we're established in Brazil. It's a it's a launch pad for Argentina and, and Paraguay, Uruguay, Bolivia as well. So um, Brazil is really the best launching pad, we thought, um, 
and so I don't want to turn people off it, but also it's good to be uh, eyes wide open on these matters. Mm. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I know Thank that you. we just have only a few minutes, uh, but I would like to ask a general question for the other three participants. Uh, actually, what are the next are the plans for your company to uh, work in Brazil? And how can a Brazilian company interested in working with you approach you? In the order that, that you presented, please. Yeah, so look, um, with Swarm Farm Robotics, um, we, we, we're still focused in Australia here for the next six months. Um, um, we, we're starting to think about now about um, so the first export markets, and we've had an enormous amount of interest out of Brazil and Argentina as well. Um, and so we're thinking about, you know, which partners would be good to work with and, and the right crops and the right regions um, to put robotics into um, in the market. So, yeah, for us, it's more about um, starting those conversations um, with, with the right farmers and the right agronomists to be working with, um, I guess, towards the end of next year. So um, really, um, best way to get in touch is, is obviously via our website or direct to my email, um, andrew at swarmfarm.com. Um, and yeah, we'd love, love to hear from interested parties. Uh, and once again, also with equipment manufacturers that um, are interested in, in, you know, in bringing their, their, their product and technology range into the autonomous agriculture market as well, um, we'd, we'd love to chat further as well. Great, thank you, Andrew. Tom? Yeah, Sebastian, um, to be honest, I was, it was more of a dipping, dipping our feet in, in the water and seeing what sort of demand or possible interest might come out of Brazil. Obviously, where where a lot of our business is is structured around irrigation, but we do do a lot of monitoring in dryland cropping as well. But um, we're really concentrating on on the US in those two states currently, and putting someone over there. But obviously, if once we're established over there, it's a good lead into into um, South America to um, once we have someone over there as well. Great, thank you, Tom. G? Uh, yeah, we're a little bit similar. We were just establishing in the US and we had plans to be in Brazil two or three times by now this year and COVID suspended all of that. So our team on the ground yep. in the US hasn't been appointed. One of them is a former Brazilian farm manager. So um, we had some warm introductions. But we just wait till this time next year, I guess. Um, we're looking for a, a distribution partner, I guess, and maybe even manufacturing. Um, supervised manufacturing would be fine. We're, we're quite open to all sorts of ideas. Um, our, our technology is not as, um, not as cutting edge as, as the technology the other three presenters have. It's big bits of steel, but um, we have worked out some very different ways of putting them together. So we're looking for someone to share that. And, and, and Brazil for us is sort of uh, alongside the US as a major target because of the similarities to the Australian environment, very tough and very distant. All right. Well, thank you uh, everyone for participating in, in this webinar, uh, for attendees either watching on uh, the, the recording version or participating right now. Uh, if you have any more questions about the presenters today, uh, please contact our office or me directly. And thank you again for joining us today. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.